About a month after Billy's murder, Mabel Norman, who had been through hell and back, escaped L.A. and retreated to this exact house in Altadena where she would spend some time resting. The 4,200-square-foot, six-bedroom, four-bath house built in 1913 also served as a great hiding spot for Mabel, and it was set up for her by her old pal Max Sennett. She wasn't hiding from the police, she was hiding from the press and from people in general. She had been extremely cooperative with investigators right off the bat. She was the last one to see him alive outside of his killer, and she knew that would make her look suspicious. Mabel's inquest, it happened right away, just a few days after the murder. People, they lined the streets trying to just get a glimpse of her as she entered the inquest, She was adamant that she and Billy were strictly very good friends. She said any letters that she may have written him were meant to be funny inside jokes between pals, not to be interpreted as love letters. Also, Mabel's alleged drug use had been brought to light in the press, which basically caused her, as well as famous players Lasky, to really defend Taylor. She went on the defense and said Billy was the cleanest, purest man she knew. He didn't touch the stuff. And the more she went on and on, it was becoming clear that if she was doing drugs, he was in fact trying to help her stay off of them. So now he's turned into this big anti-drug hero in the press, which now meant there was this whole new spin that Taylor had been killed by Mabel Norman's supplier. She was reportedly spending thousands of dollars a month on cocaine, and when her dealer got wind that Taylor was trying to nix that, he killed or had Taylor killed. This all, of course, was according to the press and rumors and speculation. A lot of really terrible things happened to Mabel during the month before she retreated here. An anonymous letter was sent to investigators saying that the gun that killed Taylor could be found in Mabel Norman's apartment on 7th Street. Police rushed over and discovered that Mabel did in fact have two guns in her apartment. However, they were each a 25 caliber, not the same gun that killed Billy. She laid as low as she could, but in the first week of March, Mabel decided to leave her apartment for the first time and she went to a jazz club. A male friend of hers was there, and they apparently danced and drank, and then he took off. On his way home, he died in an accident on the 405 freeway. Once again, there was a dead man who had last been seen by Mabel Norman. The man was married, too, so naturally the press hounded her, and Mabel couldn't go anywhere without people staring and causing a scene, so she found much solace and quiet over here over 18 miles away from the bustling, active world of show business. In 1923, Mabel Norman returned to Max Sennett and made her final movie with him, The Extra Girl. It survived and is one of Mabel's most popular movies. In it, Mabel has scenes and walks around with an actual lion. The only thing saving her from the lion's potential hunger was... (laughs) an off-camera man holding a pitchfork. The days before animal protection on set, as well as any actor protections. But the movie was a smash hit, mostly filled with people who wanted to see Mabel in the aftermath of the whole Taylor scandal. She and Mac knew this, and they incorporated two, honestly, in my opinion, pretty shocking elements into the movie. In one scene, they... I mean, you know, these were all silent movies, of course, so you don't hear anything, but you would read the title cards. So they made sure that one of the characters was named William Desmond. And they also gave audiences an absolute thrill when they saw Mabel's character holding a gun. Mac and Mabel knew exactly what they were doing, and it sort of served as a metaphor for Mabel being able to laugh it all off and put this tragedy behind her once and for all. This is the former site of the Ambassador Hotel here on Wilshire Boulevard, which opened on New Year's Day of 1921, a year before William Desmond Taylor's murder. It was converted into a school back in 2009. I mean, at least it's 
serving a great purpose now, but back in the 20s, it was home to the Coconut Grove, probably the hippest, coolest, greatest nightclub in all of LA. And it was only one block from Mary, two blocks from Mabel. Now, the press and investigators, they were so hell-bent on finding Taylor's murderer that they were dragging anyone and everyone who ever even met him into the picture. And if they were in show business, even better. Uh, a certain thing happened that just about stopped my career. I was invited to the Ambassador Grove, and uh, everybody was there. And at that time, I was working on a picture with Mickey Nealon. So... Uh, during that picture, it was when I went to the Coconut Grove, and my dinner partner was William Desmond Taylor. I had never met him before, but I thought he was very charming, and uh, uh, they sent for me in a, in, a, in a car, but he drove me home. And um, during the evening, we spoke about uh, his secretary or butler, or maybe he was a chauffeur anyway. He worked for him, and uh, when Mr. Taylor was in Europe for a vacation, Mr. Sands signed his name to uh, the bank account, or I guess he had the power of attorney to do it, and he absconded with all of his money. And um, so when Mr. Taylor came back, he found out he had no money in the bank, and uh, Mr. Sands disappeared, and I don't think he's ever been heard of since. So naturally, when um, Mr. Taylor was murdered, which was three nights uh, right after I was seen with him at the Coconut Grove, and I was working all night those three nights, out at the Vernon Country Club, and I didn't know when I read the paper that they were looking for me. They, they, they said as soon as a certain actress is found, perhaps some light would be thrown on the murder. Uh, I thought it was too bad. I didn't know him well enough <clears throat> to, to uh, be sad over it, but I, I did feel very badly about it. And uh, they finally found me down at the um, Santa Fe station the third night. We were working down there, and Mr. Nealon kept the reporters away from me until I had finished the last scene. And uh, then they came up to me and showed me the morning paper, and there my picture was on the front page, saying that perhaps I, I could uh, throw some light on the murder. And this, this was the damaging part of the story. It said that I had been seen out within the night he was murdered, and that, he, that I did not return home that night. And the next morning, his body was found cold and stiff in his luxurious apartment. Now, you know, I should have sued the paper for that because I wasn't out with him the night before he was murdered at all. It was three nights before, and uh, I, didn't, I didn't go home. I was sleeping all night, uh, uh, working all night and sleeping all day. And uh, that was for three, three nights. We worked all night. And uh, so uh, I did call the district attorney, Mr. Woolwine, he was our district attorney at the time, to see if he wanted to question me. And uh, he said, no, unless you have something you want, uh, you know, and want to tell me. And I said, uh, no, I just met him the once, and I don't know anything about Mr. Taylor's life, anything about him. But uh, his name was linked with Mary Miles Minter and, and um, Mabel Normand, if you remember. And uh, so I thought my career was ended because it, in the paper it said everybody's... Uh, who was connected with the, the, the murder would be barred from the screen. Well, Mabel Normand and Mary Miles Minter both were barred, but uh, I thought I was going to be too. All right, we are back at 7th in New Hampshire, and you can see that 7th, it dead ends right down into the side of the new school or the ghost of the old ambassador. Now, while everyone was there living their best lives and partying it up, Mary and Charlotte were back here fretting, fighting, freaking out. More and more dirt just kept getting dug up, and it turned out that when Mary was 15, she had a brief fling with her 35-year-old director, James Kirkwood, that resulted in a pregnancy. Charlotte, furious, took Mary to have an abortion, so... One could kind of see just why Charlotte became so unhinged when it appeared that Mary and Mr. Taylor were having an affair. It also explains why Charlotte publicly threatened Taylor. A story came to light that while they were living in the Fremont mansion, Charlotte and Mary had a fight that centered around Mr. Taylor, and Mary got so mad that she took her mother's gun, locked herself in a bedroom upstairs, and fired it. The bullet hit the ceiling. I mean, Mary was most likely just being dramatic and had no intentions of killing herself, but now 
Investigators wanted to see this gun. When they asked Charlotte about it, she told them, get this, that her mother, grandma, took a trip back to Louisiana to visit family and took the gun with her. When she got to Louisiana, grandma tossed it into a swampy bayou. Why? Because Charlotte was worried Mary might try a stunt like that again. Well, Sergeant King asked when this disposal of the gun happened, and his mind was blown that Grandma had tossed the gun right after Taylor's murder. All right, I know we've already seen this house, but I don't know, there's just something so ominous about visiting it at night and really so much happened while they were here towards the end of 1922 sergeant king he just was not giving up on the mary miles mentor angle so he wanted to go over the evidence again and he discovered the clothing was gone taylor's coat and vest the nightgown the handkerchief gone When he learned that the coat and vest had been sent back to the mortuary for whatever reason, he raced right over, retrieved them, and when he examined Taylor's coat, he found three strands of long blonde hairs. He collected them and he had them sent to a follicular expert, but King would need to compare them. So (laughs) this is great. He paid a delivery guy to get on to the famous player's Lasky lot sneak into Mary's dressing room and steal some hair off of one of her brushes. This actually happened and this actually worked. The expert said, without a doubt, the hairs matched. Now, Mary had admitted to seeing Taylor in December, but King, he just didn't see any world in which those hairs actually stayed on Taylor's coat for two whole months. Not with a valet as meticulous as Henry Peavy, who was constantly tending to his employer's clothes. Mary had to have seen Mr. Taylor much, much more recently than December for those hairs to be on his coat, right? As in maybe February 1st? Well, finally, this was enough evidence to make an arrest. However, King had an obstacle. Mr. Woolwine, who snatched the coat and vest away from him and locked it in his office safe. They were never seen again. Woolwine said he just didn't see any reason to arrest Mary. Can you believe that? So, for the following year, Sergeant King would now be in charge of interviewing cranks and fans of the murder case who wanted so desperately to be attached to this crime. He interviewed over a thousand people who either claimed they killed Taylor, paid someone to, or, in some cases, claimed they even saw Taylor still alive. An absolute circus. King felt beyond hopeless, and he had no idea why his boss was protecting Mary and Charlotte. What was he so afraid of? I mean, he could take credit for prosecuting a murderer of one of the most scandalous murders in L.A. history. Instead, he was focusing on running for governor of California. He lost. And it took a huge toll on his health. It made him so sick and weakened him so drastically that, much to Sergeant King's excitement, Woolwine resigned as district attorney in June of 1923. Certainly the new DA, Asa Keys, he would make some arrests, right? When Mary Miles Minter turned 21, she moved right here at the end of Argyle Avenue up in the hills of Hollywood, the Beechwood Canyon neighborhood, into her own place about 15 minutes or so from the mansion. And this house was built in 1920. Really amazing that it's still standing. I mean, I'm sure it's had a lot of work done. But the same year she moved here, Mary made four films for Paramount. After they were completed, she really started carving out a life for herself without her mother. On top of that, Mary announced to the press that she had quit show business and would never again make another film. This was true, but with a spin. The truth is, Paramount decided not to renew her contract. Her movies weren't bringing in enough money to justify her salary, and on top of that, the public had turned on her because of the whole Taylor scandal. Mary, she was actually elated to be free from it all. She partied and got involved with a wild group. 
Rumor has it she even dabbled in heroin for a short period. The worst part, though, was that she was broke and had no way of making money. Charlotte controlled all of her finances and hoarded Mary's money. I won't even go into all of it because Charlotte and Mary and even Margaret, they all went back and forth suing each other over the years, dragging one another in and out of court countless times over finances. These court appearances, though, they never kicked up the same headlines as the Taylor case, however, which was once again reopened in 1925, over three years since the murder. King had now been promoted to lieutenant, and he kept pushing his theory that Charlotte Shelby killed Taylor. He was absolutely convinced that Mary had gone over to Alvarado on the night of the murder following a fight with her mother. He thought that Charlotte then put on a disguise and went to the bungalow to see for herself if that's where Mary had fled to. He said that if Charlotte had been wearing an overcoat and a hat and a scarf to hide herself, then Faith McLean could have very well seen her and assumed she was a man. It would make sense why Faith described him as a motion picture burglar, because it was someone in a costume. But then... He scored a major revelation. Marjorie Berger, Charlotte Shelby's tax accountant, she stated that on the morning of the murder, she had received a business-related call from Charlotte who mentioned that Taylor had been shot. Marjorie was absolutely adamant that the phone call took place prior to 7.30. Well, Henry Peavy hadn't even seen Taylor's body until 7.30. King was ex even telling the press to expect an arrest any moment. Now, the new DA, Asa Keys, had no choice but to bring Charlotte Shelby in for formal questioning in the spring of 1926. And who they got was a night and day contrast to the Charlotte of before. This Charlotte praised Taylor, said he was a wonderful man, a very professional director. She never once thought for a second that there was anything going on between her daughter and Taylor. In fact, she said she loved when Mary spent time with Taylor because she thought he was a wonderful influence on her. Really a completely different tune than what everyone else had testified about during the initial investigation. But Charlotte did, however, admit that her mother, who had passed away just a few months earlier on Christmas Day, had in fact gotten rid of the gun. Mary, too, had been brought in for questioning, and she was singing a different tune now. She was much bolder with her testimony against her mother, no longer protecting her like she did before. She claimed her love of Mr. Taylor was reciprocal now, and that he wanted to marry her, but they both knew that they would never get around her overbearing, overprotective monster of a mother. Mary said, yes, indeed, her mom did go around saying that she would kill Taylor if he ever got near Mary. But there was no arrest, no indictment. The fact that Charlotte just didn't fit the description of the man Faith McLean saw and this idea of her being dressed as a man wasn't evidence. It was just that, an idea. And with no gun, they just couldn't prove she did it. So once again, King watched as Charlotte Shelby slipped through the fingers of justice. But ironically, in 1928, there was a guilty verdict. But it was actually D.A. Keyes who was the one being prosecuted. He was found guilty of misconduct for accepting bribes or something, and he was actually sentenced to jail. Lieutenant King was once again devastated, and he actually wrote a piece that was published in 1930. It was his perspective of the case called, I Know Who Killed William Desmond Taylor. He didn't flat out say her name for legal reasons and for fear of being sued, but he more than implied that the killer was Charlotte Shelby. Beverly Hills. <laughs> In the early 1920s, the city was growing rapidly. Mary Pickford and Douglas Fairbanks had their opulent mansion called Pickfair, of course, and Harold Lloyd lived in a stunning mansion called Green Acres. So it only made sense that Mabel Norman moved into this very house on Camden Drive in 1925. But I don't know, houses like this really make me wonder about renovations and what rules are in place to 
claim a house was built in a certain year because the property records on this one claim that it was built in 1924, the year before Mabel moved in. And there's an old postcard from back then advertising it as movie star Mabel Norman's house. And there's also a great photo of her sitting out front of it in her car. In the photos, you can see that the structure is still the same. The door, the windows, they're all in the same place. But this 5,500 square foot, five bedroom, seven bath house just looks so much more modern now. It really makes you wonder what exactly is still here from when Mabel lived here. Probably very little, I would imagine. Right before Mabel bought this house, she found herself caught up in yet another horrific scandal. On New Year's Day of 1924, she and her dear friend Edna Proviance, Billy Taylor's neighbor on Alvarado, you'll remember, went over to an apartment where a man named Cortland Dines lived. Dines, he was a wealthy oil man who was more than just friends with Edna. The three of them laughed and drank and did who knows what at Dine's apartment that night, but when Mabel's chauffeur came to pick her up, things went awry. Now, this is another sordid tale of he said, she said, but what we know is that Mabel's chauffeur, Horace Greer, who went by the name Joe Kelly, entered the apartment and shot Dine's three times. Dine survived. In fact, he was found in bed smoking a cigarette while Edna and Mabel were trying to apply first aid to three bullet holes. <laughs> in fact, after Joe shot him, he went straight to the police and told them exactly what he did. He said it was because Mabel was intoxicated and Dines wouldn't let her leave. Now, there was a whole new trial for Mabel to be part of, and yes, once again, the press had a field day. The only thing Edna, Mabel, and Dines could all agree on was that they were all three terribly under the influence, and none of them could really remember what exactly happened. Dines didn't even show up in court to testify, to defend himself. He didn't really seem to care, and wasn't hell-bent on making Joe pay for what he did. Joe didn't even testify. He was like, I told you, I was trying to save Mabel from this sleazy guy. Well, Joe was acquitted, but once again, Mabel and her character had been dragged through the mud. There was a rumor that Joe Kelly was in love with her and jealous of Cortland Dines. Mabel said it was all nonsense. He was just an insane man, one of the worst members of her staff, and she made sure to never see him again after he shot Dines. None of it mattered, though. Two giant scandals within two years was just too much. Her Films were once again banned, and the public turned their back on Mabel Norman. Mabel moved into this house as the story was dying down, and she managed to find work. She spent the year making a bunch of Hal Roach short films, and she also did a stint on the stage over on the East Coast for a short time. The audience mostly curious to see this scandalous, debaucherous movie star up close ended up falling in love with her. They welcomed her with massive applause, and Mabel felt great. She was acting with her voice for the first time in her life. This wasn't silent film acting, and she loved it. Back here in California, in September of 1926, Mabel was at a party with her old friend, silent film star, Lou Cody. Lou had been her leading man in Mabel's 1918 film, Mickey. Lou and Mabel were, of course, drinking and having the time of their lives when Cody jokingly proposed marriage in front of everyone. Mabel jokingly accepted his proposal, and the following morning, probably still drunk, they drove to a judge in Ventura and got married. Shortly afterwards, they admitted it had been a huge mistake and even talked about getting a divorce. They lived in separate houses, Mabel lived here, and Lou was just a few streets away on Maple Drive. The following year, in 1927, Mabel was diagnosed with tuberculosis. Although it's highly suspected that she had been suffering from it for at least a decade, she was constantly sick and would cough up blood a lot, which of course only escalated those pesky rumors of drug use. Her health most likely slowed down any talks of divorcing, as Lou remained a very close friend and one who lived nearby. He could help Mabel out as her health was declining. 
Now, apparently, the story goes that when Mabel was confined to this house, Lou would walk the eight blocks from his house, or sometimes he would send his personal valet, each morning to carry the weak and feeble Mabel down her stairs. When she was ready for bed later, he'd come back at night and carry her back up the steps. Eventually, Mabel's health got so poor that she could no longer live here. She signed a will and started gifting her possessions away and ultimately was moved out to Pottinger's Sanitarium for tuberculosis patients out in Monrovia, about 45 minutes from here, which has long been destroyed. Mabel sadly withered away, and in the last weeks of her life, she was only seen by her husband, Lou Cody, and her nurse, Julia. Now, this sounds like a made-up Hollywood anecdote, but according to several newspapers, Julia said that one of the last things Mabel ever said to her was, I do hate to go without knowing who killed poor Billy Taylor. Mabel Norman passed away on February 23rd, 1930 at the age of 37. There was a service at a funeral home downtown that was torn down long ago. It wasn't open to the public. About a hundred guests were invited, but the fans that lined the streets were in the thousands. Her body was then brought right here to the Calvary Cemetery Chapel in East LA for a private service that included Marion Davies, Marie Dressler, and Mary Pickford, who apparently couldn't stop crying. But it was Mabel's pallbearers who, I mean, they were just Hollywood royalty. Louis B. Mayer, Sid Grauman, Charlie Chaplin, D.W. Griffith, Douglas Fairbanks, and even Fatty Arbuckle. Her husband Lou was one also, and if this doesn't say something about her character, so were her exes, Max Sennett, and Samuel Goldwyn. I mean, if you just removed one of those men I mentioned, you simply would not have the Hollywood you've come to know. And I'll even go a step further and say, without Mabel Norman, you wouldn't have had those men. Mabel's father became very sick and was also dying at the same time his daughter was, but neither of them knew it. When Lou called Mabel's mother to tell her Mabel had passed, she informed him that Mabel's father had passed a few weeks before. After burying him in Staten Island, Mrs. Norman traveled out here to bury her daughter. Now, Mabel had bought a home for her parents back in Staten Island, but with Mr. Norman now gone, Mrs. Norman decided to stay out here. She died two years later. They say Mabel's death just broke her. I also read that Mary Pickford actually took care of all the arrangements for Mabel's family after she died. She apparently flew Mrs. Norman out here so she could make the funeral. Wow, it's really quite beautiful in here. Actually, this was brand new when Mabel died. In fact, there had been talk about burying her in Staten Island, but the family decided this is where she should be laid to rest. It's 
kind of odd to me that his last name is on here since their marriage was so short and so quick and silly, but it was the name she used in her will, so apparently she wanted it this way. She actually only left him one dollar in the will, stating that he was well aware of this. He didn't need it. He was rich from his own career. When talking about her early work, Mabel was quoted as saying, I had no precedent, nothing to imitate. I created my own standard of fun. Wow, I mean, really think about that. You know, writers or journalists, they like to weave pop culture and celebrities together. They'll say things like, he's the next Denzel Washington, or she reminds us of a cross between Goldie Hawn and Carol Lombard, or they'll be used in questions about inspiration. I mean, I know I like to ask people who inspired them or whatnot, but Mabel had no one, none. She didn't experience that kind of Hollywood or media. She was the first. And before she got sick, she signed with the William Morris Agency in their talkie department. Mabel Norman was gonna make talkies. How fun would that have been? I really think she would have killed it in those early 30s comedies. Her talent it was just way ahead of its time. In 1937, Mary Miles Minter was living in Beverly Hills, here in this 4,600 square foot house built in 1924. It had been seven years since Mabel Norman had died, and the William Desmond Taylor murder was all but forgotten, hardly ever mentioned in the news anymore, until Mary's sister Margaret Shelby started talking. Both women were pseudo-estranged from their mother, Charlotte. They had all three been constantly caught up in lawsuit after lawsuit with other people, with each other, and now Margaret was involved in a suit against Charlotte. Just like her sister Mary, Margaret had always stood by her story that she and Mary were alone downstairs at the Hobart house reading the night of Mr. Taylor's murder. Now, she had a different story to tell. She said that Charlotte had come over and locked Mary in her bedroom after the two had had a fight. Charlotte left, and shortly after, around 7 o'clock, Mary snuck out of her room and out of the house. She didn't return until after 8.30. Margaret also mentioned that her grandma indeed threw away Charlotte's gun in a Louisiana bayou. Well, all this was enough to reopen the case. Now, seven years was a long time in the pre-internet world. If a new story died, it died. Nobody had talked about any of this stuff in a long while, but it was all about to be splashed all over the newspapers again. The three women had moved on and even away from each other, but little did they know the old mansion on New Hampshire would soon come back into play. The new district attorney, Buren Fitz, once again called for official statements. Charlotte's chauffeur did admit that Charlotte had a 38 caliber gun. He said that it was most likely in the Louisiana Bayou, but that Charlotte had asked him to remove the ammunition from the gun right after Taylor's death because Mary was so distraught, Charlotte didn't want her to do anything crazy or try to kill herself. So when the chauffeur said that he had taken the bullets and placed them on a beam in the basement, the detectives immediately sped over here to see if these bullets would still be here 15 years after the murder. Well, the new owners let them in and guided them down to the basement, where one of the detectives reached up and started feeling the beam. To everyone's utter shock, he retrieved the bullets. They had been collecting dust all these years, but they were, in fact, the same style bullets that killed Taylor. I mean, Lieutenant King probably just wanted to drop to his knees praising Jesus. He had finally had what he needed to nail Charlotte Shelby. That spring of 1937, a grand jury was assembled, and they listened to the testimony of everyone, including Charlotte Shelby as well as Mary and Margaret. Now, despite all of Mary's anger towards her mother, she really stuck by her story and said she had never been locked in her room and that she never snuck out. 
She also said that her sister Margaret was a confused alcoholic who was simply out to get revenge against her mom for financial reasons. Margaret was actually in the middle of a civil suit against her mom, but Mary really painted an ugly picture of her sister to the jury. Charlotte, she was the last one to be interrogated. She brought along with her an actor named Carl Stockdale, because suddenly, all these years later, she now had an alibi for the night of Taylor's murder. Stockdale insisted that he had been with Charlotte here at the house. He said they were great friends and that he had, you know, just popped by for a visit, which just so happened to be during the time frame in which Taylor was murdered. Well, the grand jury convened, and after deliberation, they decided not to hand down any indictments. However, they also decided not to hand down any exonerations. This sent Charlotte into a rage. She demanded either an indictment or an exoneration because she was sick and tired of this case haunting her. She insisted she did not kill Taylor and said she wanted to live the rest of her life in peace. Well, she didn't get her wish either way, and Buren Fitz officially closed the murder case of William Desmond Taylor on September 29th, 1938. It would never again be reopened. We are in Santa Monica now, and I must tell you, this is very disappointing. Not Santa Monica, I love Santa Monica. But, you know, I got invested in this case years and years and years ago and went around to all of these locations back in the day. And had I known that this house was about to be destroyed, I would have taken some videos or photos. I'm really shocked to see it like this, but this was Mary Miles Minter's last house. Right after the case had been closed in 1938, Margaret Shelby was awarded $20,000 in her civil suit against her mother. She also publicly declared Charlotte as the killer of William Desmond Taylor. The following year, on December 21st, 1939, Margaret died following an illness. She was 39. And sometime after that, despite all of their animosity and turmoil, Mary and her mother Charlotte reconciled. Charlotte moved into Mary's Beverly Hills home, and then in the 1950s, Mary, who was living off of investments, bought this 5,500 square foot, six bedroom, nine bath home here in Santa Monica. It was built in 1907 for a bishop and really remained beautifully intact until, well, whenever this construction started. Ugh, I'm so bummed I can't show you how stately and ominous this house once stood, especially because Mary lived here for a very long time. Mother Charlotte lived with her in this house until she passed away on March 13th, 1957. She was 79 years old. Also that year, no coincidence, I'm sure, Mary married a real estate developer named Brandon O'Hildenbrandt. They remained married until his death eight years later in 1965. Following his death, Mary apparently fell into a real-life whatever-happened-to-baby-Jane scenario. She apparently surrounded herself with old photos from her film days and talked to neighbors about those golden days and Mr. Taylor, even saying to people, My mother took everything I ever loved away from me. Mary and Mom must have just had a beautiful view of the ocean and the canyon perched up on their little hill. Also, I wish every single one of you could smell these flowers. The scent is incredible. feels like you're walking through a flower shop. Now, like I said, I have no idea when this renovation started. It's not a total teardown. The house is still relatively intact, shape-wise. I could be wrong, and... I'm sure the real estate sites will claim it was built in 1907. <laughs> but in 1981, Mary, nearing 80 years old, was severely beaten during an in-home robbery here. 
She was found gagged and tied to a chair, barely alive. She survived the attack. Turns out it was a former live-in servant of hers who organized the whole thing along with her daughter and two other people. They stole close to a half a million dollars in jewelry and china and other belongings. The daughter died at some point, but I believe the housekeeper is still alive and in her 80s. Also, there's a brilliant, brilliant genius artist named Don Bacardi, who's almost 90. He lives on this street. I'm not going to show you his house, but he lived here with his longtime partner, Christopher Isherwood, another absolute genius. Christopher was a playwright, a novelist, a screenwriter, really two incredible men. They met in 1953 and were together until Isherwood passed away in 1986. Anyway, they had some great stories to tell about living next to Mary. I'm actually in the process of trying to reach Mr. Bacardi for an interview, so stay tuned. Anyway, Mary, she recovered from her brutal, horrific attack, but on August 4th, 1984, she passed away after having a stroke. Her body was cremated, and her ashes were scattered right here in the Santa Monica Bay. Possibly and probably taking the truth along with her. There have been some outlandish theories and rumors out there surrounding this case, and I don't subscribe to this one, but some people have speculated that perhaps our beloved king of comedy, Max Sennett, pulled the trigger. Very unlikely. Yes, he loved Mabel, but I don't think enough to kill. Also, Faith McLean described her motion picture burglar as short and stocky. Senate was 6'2 and very lean. There's also a rumor that a journalist, I think, got drunk with Mac one night and claimed that Mac told him he went right over to Taylor's and shot him himself. He said he did it because that damn queer got my Mabel hooked on drugs. Then Mac apparently passed out, and when he woke up, the journalist apparently pressed for more details, to which Mac reportedly said, I have no idea what you're talking about. What murder? This story also came out decades later, so I'm sure it's rubbish. But Mac did, he dedicated a couple chapters in his book, King of Comedy, to the scandal, but in no way does he offer up any sort of confession. Also, in 1974, 14 years after Senate passed away, Jerry Sherman, whose work included Hello, Dolly! and Mame, wrote Mac and Mabel, a Broadway musical starring Robert Preston as Mac and Bernadette Peters as Mabel. It opened at the Majestic Theater and was nominated for eight Tony Awards. Then, in 1992, Chaplin, starring Robert Downey Jr., was released with Dan Aykroyd as Max Sennett and the brilliant Marissa Tomei as Mabel Norman. But I'm still waiting for an epic film or series depicting the life of this brilliant man. Now for a grandiose twist of irony just down the hill from Mr. Senate here at the Holy Cross Cemetery in Culver City lies the body of someone so mysterious so dark so shady that she doesn't even have a headstone her story is very convoluted and so messy that it's really hard to unravel but it's become so intertwined with the death of William Desmond Taylor that it simply cannot be overlooked. Our final chapter, fittingly enough, takes place under the Hollywood sign in Beechwood Canyon, just a few streets away from Mary's old house on Argyle. And 
I'm gonna tell you all about the mysterious cemetery lady, even though I don't know how much faith I have in her story. Mostly because it's not that old of a theory, and it's really kind of hard to digest this late in the game, but it's important because it is a theory that has gotten major traction and is now included in most accounts about this whole murder scandal, but here goes. On October 21st, 1964, a young man was coming home to visit his parents up the hill of this street, and he noticed his mother across the street from their house, tending to their reclusive elderly neighbor. Now, this elderly neighbor had moved in back in 1949, but for the most part kept to herself. She did visit with this family from time to time, and they helped her out here and there over the 15 years she lived across from them. During one of those visits, the family had on a local television program when the host of the show mentioned that this particular episode was going to be about the murder of William Desmond Taylor, the elderly neighbor had a fit. She jumped up and started panicking, saying, Oh my God, I thought this case had been long forgotten, and was so worked up that she went home. Now, the family didn't really think much of it. They had never even heard of Taylor or this case. This, this is the house where she lived, although it didn't look anything like this. It's been renovated with a bunch of add-ons, yet when you look it up, they claim it was built in 1920. Sure. <laughs> anyway, when the young man arrived on that October afternoon in 1964, he realized his mother wasn't just tending to the elderly neighbor. She was trying to save her life. The elderly woman was on the floor by her door in the midst of a heart attack. While they were waiting for the ambulance to arrive, the woman was also demanding that they find a priest, for she had a confession. The woman was hysterical and kept saying she needed to confess something. Her confession was that she killed a Hollywood director back in the early 20s named William Desmond Taylor. Well, the mother and son, they looked at each other like, Pat? Our sweet elderly neighbor, Pat, a killer? No way. Well, sadly, Pat never made it to the hospital. She died in the ambulance, and a couple months later, the family was really surprised to learn that Pat had left this house to them in her will. As they were going through her minimalistic belongings, they discovered a small trunk filled with old glossy headshots and publicity shots and magazine and newspaper clippings and were dumbfounded to learn that sweet little Pat was actually Patricia Palmer, a silent film star, a film star with a very sordid past. Starting in 1912, she made a bunch of films under her birth name, Margaret Gibson, but in 1917, at the age of 23, she was charged with prostitution and selling opium. There was a public trial, but she was acquitted. Now, if this whole entire story wasn't crazy enough, get this. Much like Charlotte Shelby changing her daughter Juliet's name to Mary Miles Minter, Margaret Gibson changed her name to Patricia Palmer and continued working in films without the public ever knowing the difference. Again, things you could really only get away with in the early days of silent films. You know, a haircut, a different look, and you're good to go. The public will never notice. But they actually didn't. And Patricia Palmer made movies. She never reached the level of her peers, which explains why she was again arrested in 1923, the year after William Desmond Taylor's murder this time for her involvement in a national blackmail extortion ring. She was arrested at her home just down the street on Beechwood where we started, but that house is long gone. The charges were eventually dropped, but Patricia Palmer's career never fully took off. She worked sporadically for a few years, but when silent films transitioned to talkies, she never worked again. Now, it turns out she did work with William Desmond Taylor under the name Margaret Gibson, and she did cross paths with Mary Miles Minter. However, her name was never brought up during the initial investigation, and my whole issue with this theory is that it never came to light until 1999. The young man, whose name, by the way, is Ray Long, held on to what he called his little secret 
for 35 years until he reached out to Bruce Long, no relation, the guy who I told you runs the fantastic site Taylorology. Supposedly, Ray wanted Bruce's help in getting his revelations out, but why on earth would this guy sit on a confession for 35 years? And frankly, shame on him for doing so. I think he might still be alive, but either way, shame on him. He could have gone to the police, he could have gone to the press. More importantly, he could have gone to Mary Miles' mentor, who lived for two more entire decades after this supposed deathbed confession. He could have cleared her name, or at, you know, the very least, put her mind at ease. Sure, he had never heard of William Desmond Taylor at the time, but after going through Patricia's or Margaret's possessions and realizing her history, he could have put two and two together with her supposed freakout upon seeing the television program and really should have gone public with this information. And I think it's wildly irresponsible for him not to have. I'm sorry, I really have strong feelings about this. Something just does not add up. I don't buy any of it. But, once again, it just proves exactly how layered this enigma of a mystery is, and it serves as yet another reminder that we'll probably just never know the truth about what happened to poor William Desmond Taylor. I go back and forth with my theories on who I think killed Taylor. As we've seen, there are plenty of suspects to choose from, but I'll tell you who I wholeheartedly believe did not. Mabel Norman. I think it's a classic case of wrong place, wrong time. She didn't have a motive, and she was very cooperative with the investigation. It just wasn't her. Yet, you'll most likely never read or see anything about her that doesn't mention the murder. I do love that the Hollywood Walk of Fame recognized her with a star in 1960. She absolutely deserves it. And not that long ago, in 2014, my number one favorite rocker, Stevie Nicks, wrote a song about her called Mabel Norman. I just would love to see her recognized more in pop culture, like with a movie or a series based on her life, because she truly is one of the pioneers and trailblazers of this entire industry and city. While it's pretty clear we'll never know who the real killer was, I do believe that Charlotte Shelby and her little movie star daughter, Mary Miles Minter, were more involved than probably we'll ever know. Do I think Charlotte dressed as a man and pulled the trigger? No. Could she have paid someone to, or perhaps even just sent someone to scare or threaten Taylor? Absolutely. Or maybe just to spy and report back what he saw her daughter doing with Mr. Taylor. I also think Mary could have been the one to actually pull the trigger, but out of anger? No. Not even intentionally. She was a dramatic, young, naive actress, and I think she could have gone over there to threaten him or perhaps threaten suicide if Mr. Taylor didn't agree to marry her and spend the rest of his life with her. Using the gun as a bargaining tool, probably frantic and hysterical, Taylor could have tried to calm her down with an embrace and the gun went off. I definitely don't think Mary had intentions to murder anyone. I'm also really surprised she even has a star here because only a handful of her films exist. If anything, she's really only remembered for being a suspect in Hollywood's first murder mystery. Thank you so much for watching, and I'd really love to hear your thoughts on this.